everyone, my name is Julia, and as Chewy said, I work as a developer at Atlassian. Atlassian's mission is to unleash the potential of every team. And we do this by providing software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello, to name a few, to help teams collaborate and get stuff done together. At Atlassian, I work on the observability team. And one of the responsibilities we have is maintaining and providing support for our monitoring system. This system is absolutely crucial for our operations. It tells us if our services are healthy and gives us insights into them when they're not. The monitoring system is often the first indicator that something's wrong with our systems and it, gives, and it will send us alerts so that we can fix the problem as soon as possible with minimal impact to our customers. And finally, we use our monitoring system for capacity planning. Late last year, we decided to switch vendors for our monitoring system. And to help us do that, we built a pipeline using Go. I feel like switching vendors is a common ex experience across many companies, and it's something you yourself might need to encounter in the future. So today, I want to share our experience in how we approached the problem, where Go made this easy, and what we learned from it. First, let's go over what our previous pipeline looked like to get some context into the problem. So, this is our previous pipeline with the previous vendor. We haven't yet made the decision to, as to which vendor we're going with um, yet. So, as you can see, there's one of two ways that services can send their metrics into our vendor. The first is where a service sends straight into a vendor. Here, we have no idea what they're saying. Here we have no idea what data is being sent, how big it is, whether it's in the right shape or not. The second way is via something called a StatsD server. A StatsD server is responsible for the collection of metrics, processing, and aggregation of metrics. Once it's aggregated our metrics, it will then send it downstream, in this case to our vendor. You might have noticed already that our data flows are currently uncontrolled and we don't really know what we can't see, especially with services that send straight to the vendor. So we have a lack of visibility into our data. And this is actually the first of three things we want our new pipeline to help solve us, solve for us so that we can successfully migrate vendors. So the first issue is visibility. We need some insights into our data. We don't currently have a way to validate any assumptions we have about our data. We don't know if we're sending data in the right format, if our payloads are compressed, or how big they are. To add to this, we're also dependent on our vendor for usage information. And this is a bit tricky, since our vendor only gives it to us at the end of each month. This means that during the month, we might be hitting it close to our quota and have no idea about it. Right, so we need a way for this new pipeline to give us better insights into our own system. The second thing we need from our pipeline is a way to safely trial potential vendors and see if they can handle our current load of metrics. It's really important that whilst we're trialing these vendors, we don't impact the current stream of data going to our, our existing vendor. Otherwise, this is going to disrupt our ability to get the right insights and visibility into our systems. And finally, we needed a way for this new pipeline to provide us with a way to send data to both the old vendor and the new vendor once we had chosen them. We needed a migration period. Having something where we just cut over to the new vendor straight away is way too risky. We need a migration period where we can allow our users to get used to the new system and set up their dashboards and alerts and be confident that they're working. So now that we have the backstory, let's get started with building a pipeline using Go. The first step is to put a simple interface between us and our vendor. This will enable us to inspect the data and give us an interface to extend on later. In order to do this, we're going to use a reverse proxy. Great. So our pipeline's gonna go from something like this to looking more like this. As you can see, we now have this thing called a metrics proxy. We decided to spin up a new service in Go. And we chose Go because our team had prior experience in building and running other Go services in production, like Pollinator, which you might have heard yesterday in Alexander's talk. Now, a reverse proxy has the responsibility of taking a request from a client and sending it to a server on behalf of the client. 
and any response it gets back from the server, it will send back to the client. For us, this means that our reverse proxy sat inside the metrics proxy service, and it would receive requests from the statsd server, send a request to the old vendor, and any response we got back from our old vendor, we sent to our statsd server. Now, something really nifty about having a reverse proxy is you also have the ability to inspect the data, and you can also modify the incoming request, and that's what's going to enable us to get some insights on the data. Now, it was time to implement the reverse proxy in Go, and it's actually quite simple thanks to the HTTP UTIL package. It is pretty much four lines of code. Like, literally, those four lines you see there is how you implement a reverse proxy in Go. I really liked how simple and easy Go made this for us. It was way simpler than needing to do something like spinning up an Nginx server or needing to run another service. Like I mentioned, in a reverse proxy, you have the ability to inspect and modify the request. With a reverse proxy written in Go, you do this through the director func. The first thing we did with, with our director func was just to get, it, was to get it to start emitting metrics about our payload. Um, we wanted to know what our payload sizes were and whether they were compressed or not, because we currently didn't have any information on that. We noticed that our payloads were actually one megabyte in size, and they were actually, and the majority of them weren't actually being compressed. So then we extended the director func to not only emit metrics about our payload, but also start compressing the data when it wasn't coming in as compressed. And we redeployed the metric proxy, looked at the charts, and were very happy with the results. We had a saving of 94%. That is awesome. We've gone from one megabyte down to 65 kilobytes. And all we did was write four lines in Go for the reverse proxy, wrote to director func, and we had this awesome saving straight up. <laughs> Thank you. So I really liked how we had this metric proxy. It gave us the ability to get insights into our own data, and it was really easy to extend to just start compressing the data straight off. And if we didn't have the metrics proxy, we may not have known that the majority of our payloads were uncompressed. So we probably still would have been sending these one megabyte requests downstream to our vendor. Great, we now have visibility into our data. The next thing we need from our metrics pipeline is a way to safely trial multiple vendors. And what's important here is that we don't just want to send a few data points here and there to them. We want to see if they can handle our current load of metrics. So to give you an idea of how much we're sending, it's a lot. It's about 10 megabytes a second or 600,000 metrics a second. Remember, these metrics are absolutely crucial to our operation. They give us insights into the operational health of our services, and they're often the first indicators that something in our system is broken. So we can't afford to impact on the stability of our metric stream during the trials. So the solution we had was to get a way to fork our data stream. In order to do this, we use something called AWS Kinesis. And AWS Kinesis Data Stream provides you with a scalable way to perform real-time processing of streaming data. You have producers that are writing to a stream and consumers reading off the stream. And something nice about having a Kinesis Stream is that it can also retain data for a period of time. And so this will also give you the ability to rewind and replay your data. So then our pipeline went from the addition of a metrics proxy to something like this. So you'll notice now that our metrics proxy is sending to two places. It's sending both to our old vendor and to our Kinesis stream. So in this case, it's our producer. On the other side of the Kinesis stream, you'll notice that we have this thing called a stream worker. In this case, it's our consumer and it's reading off the Kinesis stream. Our stream workers are also sending data to our trial vendors as well. So by forking our data stream and sending it to Kinesis, this enabled us to test potential vendors with our real load of metrics. And we didn't need to worry about impacting the stability of our metrics flowing through the old vendor because this was on a separate path. Now, what's worth noting here is that our stream worker that's sending metrics to our trial vendors is actually a Java server not a go one. And whilst there's a lot of, whilst I didn't expect that reaction, um, 
whilst there's a lot of open source Go stream workers out there, none of them met our requirements and had full feature parity with the Java stream workers. Now, in Kinesis, you have a stream, and a stream is composed of a set of shards. Shards can split and merge to accommodate for changes in capacity. And when you have a stream worker, when you have a single stream worker, it knows to just read all the, all the shards. That's easy. However, Kinesis allows you to have multiple stream workers um, to allow you to horizontally scale. And then you have the issue of which stream worker should re read which shard. And in Kinesis, we call this concept a lease. And this is where a lot of our Go stream workers that we were looking at kind of fell short. So the three main areas we found that they fell short in were, number one, we needed them to be able to handle the discovery of new shards and handle when shards were split and merged. Number two, we needed them to be able to handle lease coordination. We wanted to keep the same worker with the same shard for the duration of its lifetime. We found that a few libraries would actually throw the shards around for a bit and sometimes we would have stream workers reading off the same shard. And the third requirement was we needed to be able to balance shard ownership over a worker pool that could shrink and grow in size. So it not only needed to be able to grab new shards, but it also needed to be able to, to pick up shards when a stream worker died. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a Go stream worker that met all three of these requirements. At most, we met two out of three of the requirements. Fortunately for us, we had a logging team that also worked with us under the observability team, and they had lots of prior knowledge and experience with running Java stream workers. They provided us with a Java stream worker that we could easily adapt to do what we wanted, which was send metrics to our trial vendors. Great. So our trial's done, we've chosen our new vendor, we're ready to get moving. The plan was then to use the stream worker to send data to both the old vendor and the new vendor. But we had two concerns around doing this. The first concern is we're a team of Go developers and we lack Java expertise. We don't have experience with running Java applications in production, but we do have a lot of experience with running Go applications in production. The second concern we had was both of, our metric, both of our vendors expect data to be sent in chronological order. Now, because we're using multiple stream workers here, there is no way to guarantee delivery order with a Kinesis stream when using multiple stream workers. Whilst this was okay for our trials because we weren't officially relying on it, it wouldn't be okay for the real deal because we would be dropping people's metrics and we might not know whether our systems are healthy or not. So we came up with a decision. So we needed to make a decision. We either needed to fix the order in which the Kinesis workers would send data and remember they're in Java, or we take advantage of the metrics proxy we already have that's sending data to the old vendor. In the end, we decided to go with, the, with sending via the proxy because we had that Go experience and we were able to leverage the work we previously did with getting the metrics proxy to send data to our old vendor. So then our pipeline looked more like this. As you'll notice, we kept Kinesis around and it allowed us to have a fork of our data stream. Um, fork of our data stream. We also changed our stream worker from shipping metrics to our trial vendors to performing analytics on our metrics. And this gives us even greater visibility into our systems. And now we can get information like the top metrics that are being sent and the metrics with the highest cardinality. Great, we've chosen our new vendor and it's time to start sending data to the new vendor via the metrics proxy. However, one problem we have right now is that services are currently sending to the vendor using a previous format, which only the old vendor supports. And our new vendor has a completely different format, which they support. We can't directly switch over and ask our users to start using the new vendor format, because then data would only be going into one system. And we need to give them time to migrate their dashboards and alerts. So we decided that we needed a way to send data in parallel to both the new vendor and the old vendor. In order to do this, we decided to add a step into our proxy to act as a translation layer. 
the way we did this was we have our metrics proxy, which is receiving a JSON payload with data in the old vendor format. Inside the metrics proxy, we defined a struct with the old vendor format and added the relevant JSON tags to it. We then used the Go JSON package to call our marshal on the JSON payload and turn it into a struct. Although this is a simple concept, I really liked how straightforward it was with Go. All I needed to do was define my struct, add the JSON tags, and call a marshal on it. Later on, we actually switched to the JSON iterator library, which is a drop-in replacement for the JSON package, and that helped improve the performance of the JSON our marshalling. Great, so we've now got our um, metric data in the previous form vendor format in a struct. The next part is to translate it into the new vendor format. Thankfully for us, the new vendor we were moving to had a Go library, and this Go library provided us with um, structs for the data format they accepted. And it also handled the conversion of the struct to a protobuf and the sending of the protobuf downstream. If you're not too sure what a protobuf is, you can think of it as an efficient mechanism for serializing structured data. Then once we, okay, so then all we needed to do now was write a func to convert from our old, match, our old vendor struct format into our new vendor struct format. And this was fairly simple. It was just a matter of massaging the data into a new format. Great. So now we have a way to send data to both vendors. But we have a new problem. We're quickly approaching our usage quota on the old vendor, and we're not yet ready to move to the new vendor. So we need to figure out a way, so we need a way for us to quickly drop our usage on the old vendor. To overcome this problem, we implemented a metric block list in the metric proxy to help quickly reduce our usage. The way we did this was we used our stream worker, which is currently performing analytics now, to get the top 5,000 metrics. Now, something we say in our monitoring bootcamp is that if a metric isn't on a dashboard or an alert, then it's not being used. So we then pulled down the config for all our dashboards and alerts in the old vendor grabbed the metrics that were being used and wrote a script to cross-check the metrics used in these with the metrics in the top 5,000. Any metrics from the top 5,000 that didn't appear on a dashboard or an alert, we put in our metric block list, and this allowed us to reduce our usage by a third and thankfully kept us under the quota for our old vendor. If we didn't have the metrics proxy or the stream worker performing analytics, there's a good chance that we might have actually hit the quota and we, and we wouldn't have had a way to drop our use metrics usage as quickly. Great, so we're sending data to both vendors. Let's take a step back and revisit our StatsD server. To quickly refresh our memory on what a StatsD server does, it's in charge of collecting raw metrics from a service, processing the metrics where it can add things like metadata to it, aggregate the metrics and send them downstream to the configured backend. In this case, it would send to our metrics proxy. One thing to note is that services will send their metrics to the StatsD server via UDP. And this means that we can occasionally see data loss because there's no guarantee that our datagrams will arrive. At Atlassian, we use an implementation of StatsD called GoStatsD. It's an open source library that's maintained by Atlassian, and like the name suggests, it's implemented using Go. During the migration, we saw an opportunity to improve this library by reducing the amount of data we sent and by moving to a horizontally scalable solution for UDP ingestion. Something important during the development of GoStatsD that we needed to consider was we needed a way to ensure that we didn't lose the raw data points, otherwise the quality of our data would drop. So in order to address those two problems, we decided to split GoStatsD out to operate in two modes, which we call forwarder and aggregator. This enables us to separate out the responsibility of consolidation from aggregation. Great, so let's start with the service. Nothing changes here on the service side with how they send metrics. It's still via UDP and it's still the raw metrics. It will go to the first StatsD server, which is running in forwarder mode. Forwarder mode is in charge of collecting raw metrics, processing them where it will add metadata, 
consolidating and then consolidating them together. For example, if we have a metric type of counter, we know that we can straight away sum all the data and we won't lose any quality of this. Once it performs the consolidation stage, the forwarder will then pack the consolidated metrics into a protobuf and send it to an aggregation statsd server via HTTP. Then our statsd server running in aggregation mode will unpack the protobuf, perform aggregation on the data, and then marshal the aggregated data into a JSON payload. It will then send this JSON payload downstream. As you can see, by splitting GhostStatsD out to run in two modes, we've been able to reduce the amount we ship over the wire without losing raw data, thanks to having a compaction stage and by using protobufs in the forwarder mode. Now that we have these two modes, let's see how we implemented them in our pipeline. To help explain the changes, I'm going to refer to the previous version <laughs> where GhostStatsD did all the things as v1 and the split into forwarder and aggregator as v2. So you can see here we have the pipeline that we've seen before and now our StatsD server there is v1. To start using the forwarder and aggregator mode in our pipeline, we added a new path into our system. As you can see, we have our StatsD sidecar and it's running in forwarder mode. You can think of a sidecar as a process that runs alongside an application and it sits on the same host. It's a bit like a pod running on Kubernetes or a daemon that's running on a box. We have our sidecar sending to the statsd server running in aggregator mode. So that's the statsd server v2 you see there. And then our statsd server running in aggregator mode will send into our metrics proxy. However, we still have our earlier problem, and that is data is still being sent straight into the vendor, and we still have no insights and control over this. Not only this, but we also have two StatsD servers running. And in our users' eyes, they probably don't see a reason to move to v2 because v1 still works for what they want, which is to ship metrics. In order to correct and address both of these things, we added a rule in our metrics proxy that says, if a request has come from the StatsD sidecar, it can be sent to both the old vendor and new vendor. However, if we get a request and it hasn't been and it hasn't gone through a StatsD sidecar, we only send it to an old vendor. Therefore, by using this carrot approach, we got people to move on to the sidecar if they wanted to send to the new vendor. So it's something important to know is that in GhostStatsD, we hold the metrics in memory, and so processing can be quite memory intensive. During development, we needed a way to be able to test the impact of our changes and to see if something like um, adding a deduplicating data stage would have a significant impact on performance and memory. As GhostStatsD is written in Go, we could easily take advantage of benchmarks and XFAR. Benchmarks allowed us to assess the impact of um, our code and see the before and after impact. So we could see the changes in the number of memory allocations, and the time it took for these functions to execute. This helped us assess the impact without needing to constantly deploy and play around with data. The second thing we found useful was XFAR. It, get, it enabled us to keep an eye on our overall memory stats, so things like heap memory and garbage collection cycle. So the data that you can see here. We found these tools really useful because it was built in and required very little work to get started. So that was quite a lot. So let's quickly take a look back at where we started and how we got to where we are now. So before, when we were sending to the previous vendor, we had a pipeline where we had limited insights into our data and we were dependent on our vendor for information about our data. We had uncontrolled and invisible data flows. We had no idea how many people were sending from their service straight into the vendor versus those who were sending from their service via the StatsD server. And we also didn't have a way to safely test out our changes or experiment with our data. And today, this is what our pipeline looks like. We now have a way to get visibility and control over our data. And our pipeline has also helped to enable us to trial multiple vendors with our real load of data and send in parallel to both the old and new vendor during the migration period. It's also provided us with an avenue to safely experiment and test changes via a Kinesis stream. 
We've also been able to reduce the amount of data sent over the wire by splitting ghosts that stay out into a forwarder and aggregator mode. So we've learned a lot from this experience and I want to end by sharing some learnings about Go and building a pipeline. The first is HTTP util. I love how easy Go made this to just spin up a reverse proxy. Pretty much four lines and even writing the director func was very straightforward. There's a lot of great docs out here and I really like how Go enabled us to just get on with feature development without worrying about the implementation. <coughs> The second thing about Go I liked was having benchmarking and XFAR tools. I liked how these were built in. I didn't need to download any additional software. And it was really easy to get started with both of them. There's also lots of great blogs out there about how others have used these tools to solve some really interesting problems. And the final thing about Go is we still lack a Kinesis stream worker implemented in Go that has feature parity with Java. However, the good thing is that most of the Go stream workers out there are open source. So there is the opportunity, the opportunity to go out there and hopefully update one to have full feature parity with the Java ones. And on the pipeline side of things, add an interface early. Something as simple as routing traffic through a reverse proxy is a great start. It means that your data flows are no longer invisible. And you can always go back and extend this interface later. For example, for us, the metrics proxy gave us a really early win by compressing the data. The second is have insights and control over your data. Having insights and control over your data gives you knowledge about the data you're sending. Don't just rely on your vendor to give you information. Get it yourself. And because of this, we now have greater insights and control over the data that gets sent. For example, the metric block list we implemented in our metric proxy has come in handy so many times. We had um, something a few months ago where a metric suddenly exploded in cardinality and to stop it from hitting our quota and to give that team more time to fix it, we added it to our metric block list. Finally, have a way to experiment safely with your data. For us, having a fork of our data stream was so valuable because it enabled us to trial different <laughs> vendors and also send to these trial vendors with our real load of data. It also enabled us to have an avenue to play around with the data and get analytics on it. And to this day, we still use the Kinesis stream um, during our innovation weeks and ship it to play around and get more insights into our data. So I hope you've learned something new today and you've enjoyed hearing about our experience using Go to build a metrics pipeline and how it helped us to migrate vendors. Thank you.